morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to be with you. Man, God is good all the time. You know, I was looking forward to, I had a wedding in Edmonton uh, yesterday, and so we drove up Friday, and so with this all in mind, I thought, you know what, I'm going to get someone else to preach in my church so that I don't have to preach on Sunday. And so I, I was very smart, and I had it all prearranged and everything so I could relax this morning. And, uh, and so on Friday, we're on our way up to Edmonton, and uh, I get a call about 5 o'clock or a text from Ken, and he says, um, Willie, um, do you have a service Sunday morning? I says, yes. Please text um, What time? 10.30. And that was it. And I thought, is he going to show up in our church? I didn't know what he was going to do. And I, so I said, FYI, uh, you know, we pulled up some things about our church, where we're at, and everything. And he says, well, basically, I need someone to fill in with what's happening here this morning. And, and so, but what had happened is Friday morning, I'm not having to preach. And, I, you know, I take that time to prepare. So Friday morning, I'm preparing. And, um, uh, you know, I, I just, I'm having my devotional time. And I, suddenly, God began to perk a word in me, you know. And, for, and I, I said to Laura afterwards, I says, if I had to preach on Sunday, I could preach. You know, I just felt I had the word. And so, so when Ken said that, I said, I guess I got to do it. And now I've got a different word than the one he gave me. So, so anyways, good morning. Good to be here this morning. And so, you know what? I, I just thank God. Some of our best friends in our city are the pastors we serve alongside with in different churches. Isn't that good? Yeah. You know, we're not in com competition. We celebrate each other. and We, we cry together. We cheer on, on each other. And so... And so, you know, Teresa, I just want to say, you're one of our buddies, you know. And so, you know, we had, we were, we were together planning a Good Friday service that really was initiated years ago uh, with Ken and, and Peter. And, and it was like, hey, we should, we should get churches together to start having, uh, celebrate Good Friday together. And, and so we, I've been a part of that for the, I don't know how many years, five, six, seven years. And so different times we would have different speakers. And, and it was like, who do we have this year? And uh, it was just, someone said, what about Teresa? And uh, everybody says, yes, we're down for Teresa, you know? <laughs> and they said, you know what, even if she blubbered and sobbed all the way through it, we want Teresa, you know? And you know what, Teresa, she ministered and it was awesome. You know, the words just fell and they, they dropped, uh, you know, they hit you. They, they, were, they were impactful and so, so God is good, amen. And so. You know, before I get into my message, you know, my, my wife, Laura, and she's not going to hear this, right? Uh, <laughs> but uh, maybe nine months ago or so, she started experiencing where, you know, hair was, you know, she'd, she'd find hair in her comb and in the shower and different things. And, and she'd, she'd be sort of like, I'm losing my hair, you know. And, and uh, anyways, you know what she would do? She, she would begin to speak to her hair. She would say... For every hair that I lose, I'm, I'm asking for seven to replace that one, you know? And so she had got her hair cut this last Thursday, and the stylist is working on her, and the stylist says, doesn't know anything about what Laura's been going through, and she says, um, Laura, I see new growth in your hair. What's with that, you know? <laughs> you know what? I mean, but, but I think it's a prophetic thing that things that are lost that God wants to restore that God wants to restore things, you know, and, and it's like, you know, whether it's finances or different things in the area of a church, you know, for every person that this church has ever lost, I call in seven more, amen? Father, Father, for a restoration, Father, I pray for a restoration on each one of you, and whatever things you've lost, whatever thing you, you have needed, Father, I thank you for a restoration at least seven times, amen. in Jesus' name, amen. amen? So my message this morning is called, What Do You Have? In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12, it says, For there is, if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. You got that? If there is first a willing heart, it's accepted according to what you have, not what you don't have. You know, many times, I don't know if you're like me, sometimes we think of what we don't have what we don't have, what the talents we don't have. And God's not asking us for the talents we don't have, but he's asking us for what we do have. Amen? You know, I remember, our, well, our church, she says 30 years. It was 40 years ago our church was started, not by us, 
But uh, I was a part of the church 40 years ago and uh, started on June 6, 1982, and I was five years old at the time, so, so I'm 45 now. <laughs> a little bit somewhere in there. Anyways, um, you know, as the, as the church started, um, you know, there were, it was like I didn't want to ever want to be in front of people. That was not my place, you know, but I had a pickup truck and I had a topper on it, and, and uh, we were setting up with sound equipment and different things, and and I just saw him eat, and I says, you know what, I've got a truck, I can take the sound equipment, you know. And so, you know, God was asking, not for what I, not for what I didn't have, but what I did have. And I became available, and then, you know, I, I used to play guitar. And, uh, you know, John Redekop would not think I played guitar, but uh, <laughs> uh, I could play like three chords, you know. And, and I, you know, I, 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 I play song, some songs like, Old oh, Stu Ball was a racehorse, and it was like three chords. And it was, <laughs> make the girls cry around the fireplace. And, and so, anyways, as the, as the church was beginning, they began to form a little worship team, you know, and, and, uh, and I brought my guitar, and, and I would just watch everyone else as they're changing their chords, you know, and it's like, you know, all the different things. I had three chords to learn. And, uh, but you know what, I, I just gave God what I had. Found out later they would turn out my sound when they would be playing, and, and I was just up there for an ornament, you know, to say, hey, we got a full band. But uh, but what began to happen? I got better at it. I began to use my guitar, and uh, and I would look around. Sometimes we'd have meetings on a Tuesday night or what, a Thursday night, and some of the main leaders weren't, wouldn't show up, and they'd look to me, and now I'm having to lead worship on a Wednesday night or a Thursday night. It was like, oh. But you know, I gave God what I had. You know, God's not asking for what you don't have, He's asking for what you do have. That's right. Amen? And so, you know what, everyone here has something. We all have something, but God's not asking for what you don't have, He's asking for what you do have. So don't think, don't discount yourself, don't discount your abilities, your talents, or different things, because God is looking at what you do have. You know, I like in 2 Corinthians 12, you know, God is, God's strength is made perfect in weakness. When I'm weak, then he is strong. You know, that's the place where grace shows up. Amen? Yeah. And so I want to give you five areas where uh, it's important for us to remember that God wants what we have. And the first area is God, give God what you have. In 2 Corinthians, or 2 Kings chapter 17 and verse 10, it says, So he rose, this is Elijah, and went to Zarephath. You know, I like that. You know, there was shortages in Israel. There was a famine. And uh, you know what? God was able to take ravens that are, you know, they, they eat the scraps of meat, right? That's what they do. But they were carrying the food to Elijah at the brook called Cherish. They, they brought the bread, you know, from Jezebel's table. And, and as they would bring the bread, uh, one day the creek dried up and it says, it's time to go to a different place. And so I'm, I'm thinking that Elijah said, I'm going to go to a rich widow's place. And so he goes to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there, going to get, it, to get it, he called her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hands. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have any bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it, for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first, and bring it to me. And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour of oil, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor the oil of jar run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. And so she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. And the bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. You know, God wants what you have. Give him what you have. Amen. Can we say that this morning? I'm giving God what I have. You know, I've got a little... Uh, uh, thing of flour, I think it's pancake mix, and so I'm going to give this to Teresa this morning. You know, make pancakes for everyone, <laughs> but make me a cake first, amen. You know, God, God does something with the little when we give it to Him. 
He's not asking for what we don't have. Isn't that good news? He's asking for what I have. What do you have in your house? What do you have? What, what is available? Can I make myself available? And you think, well, God, God does not, he's not impressed with the great things you have and he doesn't despise the little things that you have, amen? He just wants you to, this is what I have. I dedicate this to you. I like this morning, we're dedicating Maverick. And we're, and you know, the, the mom and dad says, you know, here he is. We're dedicating to use him. He's just little, but he's got great things. He's got great potential, amen? There's great things in that boy. What do you have in your heart? You know what, here I am talking in front of people. I used to be scared talking in front of three people. And I, I went to a Bible school, Laura and I did, and, uh, in the early days of our church, and we went down to the States. And you know, on second year, I had to choose uh, an area to go into, and, I, and the area that I felt to go into was pastoring. And uh, one of my friends that had known me for like, many years, he, when I told him I was going into pastoring, he kind of looked at me, he laughed, and says, you, pastor? But I gave God what I had. Amen? God doesn't ask what you don't have. What do you have? Number two, God will multiply what you have. You know, Jesus is ministering. Thousands of people are gathered on the hillside. And, you know, after, I think it's like three days, he says, you know what? Compassion filled this heart. He says, we need to feed them. And he's, he says to his disciples, you feed them. And uh, he said, you know, even if we had 200 pence or whatever it was, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them all. And one of his disciples here in verse 8, it says, and Andrew, Simon's, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves, two small fish, but what are they among so many? What are they among so many? And then Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in the, in the number of about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting around, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. You know, I like that, as much as they wanted. You know, just speaking of some of the, the stuff that's going on, I, I just felt the Lord speak to me uh, in the last couple of weeks, you know, because you, you hear so much about inflation, and you see the gas prices on the, on the pumps and all those things, and, and, and I felt like the Lord said, don't let the recession, and don't let the inflation get in your heart. Don't allow that to get a hold of you. Don't let it get in you. Like, we don't have to participate in it. You know, and I, and I, I want to, you know, when, when I go to a store and I, you know, if it's like steak has gone up so much, you know what? I'm going to buy steak. You know what? I'm, I'm going to buy it. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, you might have a budget, but I, I don't want to be limited by what I don't have. God wants to multiply. He doesn't want the recession. He doesn't want inflation to get in our hearts. Amen? Number, and so, so Jesus took um, five loaves and two fish. You know, after this service is done, Teresa is going to have tuna salad sandwiches for the whole world. And so, God will multiply what you have. I went grocery shopping this morning. Chocolate? But I have some in that basket there. <laughs> and so, can you imagine feeding probably 15,000 people with that kind of food? Right. Amen? Amen? But God got involved. Yeah. And God wants to multiply what you have. Right. When we give to God, God will begin to multiply things. God's going to begin to multiply things in this house that you never thought so. There's going to be some things and gifts and people that God is going to multiply. And some of them are sitting right on the front row here. I'm not going to mention her name. Amen. They ate as much as they wanted. There was, there's no shortage with God. Number three, God will transform what you have. Moses grew up in Egypt, you know, as a young boy. He grew up in Pharaoh's household. And of course, we know the story. At the age of 40, he gets into a fight and has to run, flee for his life into the Mennonite country. 
I mean, midnight, midi, midi at night country. I've said that for John. Here we are in Minnow Simon School. And uh, after 40 years, God begins to rest, get Moses' attention, has a burning bush, right? And uh, Moses turns in and God, God begins to call him and says, you know, I've, I've heard the cries of the people. It's time for them to be set free. Amen. And so, but Moses, having been trained in the universities of Egypt and all that, he'd been so long in the land of Midian, he forgot how to speak the language of Egypt, of the Egyptians, I guess. And uh, he says, I don't know how to speak. I don't know. You got the wrong guy. And uh, here in Exodus chapter 3, verse 11, Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? and that I should bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. You know, he kept saying, I don't know how to speak. Yeah. We know that God can put words in your mouth. God can take your tongue, he can loosen, he can, he can do something. You know, and actually in Acts chapter seven, Stephen, if you read that part, Stephen gives the story, he recounts the whole story of, of Israel being in Egypt and about Moses being um, called. And you know what he says? Moses was very eloquent in speech. And yet he came to the place in his life where he says, I don't know if I have it. I don't know if I've got the goods anymore. You know, he had come to a place of weakness. And when you come to a place of weakness, God is in a place of strength in your life. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. That's right. Amen. God's not impressed with our strength. You know, we think sometimes, oh, I've got this great gift and God needs me. No, God just needs you yeah. in your weaknesses, in whatever. Because, you know, it's not you that makes the difference. It's Him. Right. Amen? Amen. That's right. But I want to say God's going to transform what you have. In chapter 4, verse 1, Then Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. You know, this rod had traveled with Moses for many years, right? He probably picked it on his way, picked it up on his way as he was fleeing Egypt and saw an almond tree, and he thought, you know, I think that will work. And he broke off a branch, polished it up, and he used it for his business, taking care of sheep. This way, this way, right? It was his instrument for his work. That's all it was. It was nothing. And Moses is wondering, how are you going to use me? How, I, I've got nothing. And God says, I see a stick in your hand. What about the stick in your hand? God, you can, no, there's no possible way you could ever use this, right? And he says, throw it down. It became a snake. Pick it up. It became a rod again. Later on, him and Aaron, they go to Egypt. And they're confronting the, the, the powers of darkness. It's interesting, they didn't confront the, the high court or the parliament. They encountered the magicians of the land, right. the spiritual authorities of the land. Okay. Amen? And they brought, brought the priests, they brought their priests together, and they had rods. And Aaron and Moses threw down their rod, and it became a serpent again. The priests of Egypt, they threw down their rod, and they became servants. Quite, quite significant that they could do that. Yeah. Amen? I mean, that's, that's for real. That's not some kind of, you know, America's Got Talent kind of magician. <laughs> Amen? And what happened is 
their rods began to swallow up the other rods. Amen? In other words, God says, that little rod in your hand has power because I'm in it. And I can swallow every opposition that stands in your way. And, I, and every opposition that has stood in your way, it's nothing. It's no match for you. Throw down your rod, you know. And so, you know, I, I look at this as, you know what, maybe, maybe it's your rod is your, maybe you're a painter. You know, John, you said you have a business. Uh, different people, maybe you're a school teacher, maybe you're a nurse, a doctor, a bus driver, a taxi driver, Uber driver, skip the dishes, whatever it is, throw it down. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Just throw it down. I'm just a mom. Throw it down. God will transform what you have. Right. Amen? Yeah. God wants to take what you have and bring life into it. Later on, the rod was used. Put your hand, put your stick in the sky, and hail was formed, and flies were formed. And later on, they came up to the Red Sea, and it was stretch forth your rod. Yeah, yeah. Amen? The rod that was nothing became the scepter in their hands. Yeah. Throw it down. God, I give it to you. Later on, it was like, who's the leader? Now I'm talking about Aaron's rod, I guess, now. But which, which who's, who's the real, who should be the leadership? And, and all the tribes brought their rods, right? All the leaders brought their rods and they, they put them in front of the ark. The next morning they came and there was one rod. All the other rods were the same, but the one rod had changed. Not only did it have sprouts on it, not only did it have flowers on it, but it had mature fruit. Supernatural rods, amen? God will transform what you have. You know, there's some things that need to be swallowed up. You know, there's some things in your businesses in different places that God wants to swallow up the oppositions. How many know that Canada needs some people with their rods? You know, when we need people in, in political places and places of, of government and different things, throw down your rod. There's a business uh, man that I know, and Teresa, you might know him, uh, Dave Petty. Uh, he has a large roofing business and probably has 130 employees. And, but you know what? Every, I think it's Tuesday or Wednesday, they have a prayer meeting in their place. And a lot of these business are, they're, they're contractors, but they don't even know God, but they come there to pray. And they get their prayers answered. And they meet on the rooftops and they pray. And he's turning his little business into, God is transforming it. God is doing something with it. One, one of the, one of his uh, staff had a, his wife was diagnosed with cancer. And, uh, and they, they shared it with us. And I said, well, why don't you go there and pray? I said, Lord, and I would come and pray for them. And uh, they didn't need us. They went there and prayed for them. And uh, she was in stage four cancer. And, and uh, they, they went there and they prayed for her. And uh, I think about three months later, she comes with a gift of goodies and all kinds of stuff. She's free of cancer. I said, God, is, there's healing in this house. Can I just declare there's healing in this house? God will transform what you have. Number four, God will empower what you have. John, get ready. In the book of Gideon, or the book of Gideon, come on now. In the book of Judges, it's right after the book of Moses and the book of Noah. In Judges chapter 6, the Midianites are in the land of Israel and they come to steal the harvest. You know what? The enemy is after your harvest. He's, he's, he's after the things that you believe in. He's after, after the fruit. He's after your kids. And then and the children of Israel cried out. In Judges chapter 6, verse 12, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. 
And Gideon said to him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles? Which our fathers have told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall, have, you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Have I not sent you? You know the word sent in the New Testament actually is apostolic. There's an apostolic assignment on this house. Amen. There's an apostolic vision in this house. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. Weakest, least. You're about ready to be used by God. Weakest, least. You know, in, 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 our, in our society, it's, people want to put themselves forward. And I have this strength. And people write their resumes, and it's like, you know, hardly recognize the person when they write their resumes because it's like, these are all my great strengths. People don't pull out their, their resume. I'd like to give you a lot of my weaknesses. I'm not very good at keeping time. I'm not good at being diligent. <laughs> These are all my weaknesses. And God, when we put, put our, our resume before God and these are my weaknesses, God says, I like that. I can use that. I can work with that. Are you hearing me this morning? I'm the weakest, the least. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you. And you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. You know, when you ever see that word, the Lord will be with you. From a Jewish mind, it always means success. The Lord was with David, and he had great success. The Lord was with Joseph. Well, I wish that would happen to me. Amen. I wish the Lord was with me. Is the Lord with us? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Behold, I'm with you even to the end of the earth. In verse 33. Then all the Midianites and the Malachites and the people of these gathered together and they crossed over and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and then he blew the ram's horn or the trumpet. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. I'm going to read that again. And then he blew the ram's horn, the trumpet. <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> what a unique, what a, what a surprise for that to happen at that moment. <laughs> I was talking to Teresa, I said, did somebody blow the, uh, a shofar? And she said, Peter did. The first day of this service here, he blew the shofar. How many were there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, I believe that there was a sound in this place. And there's a sound that is beyond what is up here and what is down there. If there's a sound that wants to touch the neighbors, that wants to, there's a sound in this place. Amen. Amen. There's a sound, but something happens in the sound. When the sound came in, the, it says, and then the Abervites, the, those kind of ites, <laughs> gathered behind him. And he sent messengers through all Manasseh who also gathered behind him. And he also sent mass messengers to Asher and Zebulun and Naphtali, and they came up to meet them. Amen? There is a sound coming, and they're coming. There's a sound going out, and they're coming. They're being gathered. I need to hear that again. The sound. There's a sound. There's a trumpet sound. <laughs> sound. God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. 
But you know what? You know what? It says there. You know how how uh, Gideon said, "I'm the least and I'm the weakest." Yeah. But it, it says here, "But say but." but. It's important where you have a, your butt on a Sunday morning. <laughs> you know, but is a transaction, right? Or not? It's a what is it? It's a anyway. It, but and and is a connecting word, right, between two thoughts. You know, you know how many know, sometimes someone says to you, I love you, but. <laughs> what they're really wanting to say is not, I love you, but what follows after that. You know, in Acts chapter 12, it's like uh, James had been beheaded, and now they took Peter and put him in prison. And then it says, but prayer was made. But. But prayer. Yeah. There was a but. It canceled out what was going to happen. And something changed. You know, there needs to be some buts. The enemy says this, but. And so, in verse 33, all the Midianites and the Malachites and the people of the East gathered together and they crossed over and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. You know, the, the real Hebrew language of that is, and God clothed himself with Gideon. That's Gideon. And I'm God. And God is looking, who can I wear? Who can I wear this morning? I need, I, I, my wardrobe, I, I'm looking through my wardrobe, who, who can I use? I want to dress. God likes to dress himself with us. And he picks up Gideon and he puts him on. And then something began to happen. You know, people's lives, ordinary people did amazing things when God put them on. When God puts you on, how many are ready for God to put you on? I believe that's a, it's a time of remantling. For God to begin to put a fresh mantle on people, a fresh mantle even on this house. That God wants to remantle you with himself. And that even in the middle of the summer, you know, there's a scripture in Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 2. It says, in, revive us, O Lord, in the middle of the year. We're in the middle of the year. And we think of summer and it's time to kick back and church takes pause. But what if God says, I'm going to have send revival in the middle of the year, and you don't have to do it. I'm going to put you on. I'm going to wear you. You're going to do barbecues, and your friends are going to come over, and you're going to share the word. You're going to share your story, and God is going to begin to touch people. And they're going to be coming from all over the place. They're going to be coming, and every Sunday there will be new people coming in here because God is reviving you in the middle of the year. God clothed himself with Teresa. Isn't that good? God clothed himself with Derek. Yeah, he even clothed himself with me. <laughs> Amen. God wants to clothe himself. There's a new sound. Great worship. God is clothing our worship teams. Amen. And number five is my last. I'm sorry if I'm taking too long. God will use what you have. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elijah, saying, Your servant, my husband, has passed away. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditors coming to take my sons to be his slaves. And so Elijah said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. And then he said to her, go and borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels, and do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, and then pour it out into the, all those vessels and set it aside, the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her. She poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, Bring me another vessel, he said to her, there's not another vessel. So the oil ceased, 
And then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go and sell the oil and pay your debt. You and your sons live on the rest. You know, it's interesting. I think I have something else here. I do. I have a jar of oil. I wonder where I got that from. Jar of oil. You know, sometimes we, we think heaven controls earth, but many times earth controls heaven. You know what, God, God, what, what stopped the oil from flowing was not God. What stopped the oil was there was no more vessels. I wonder if afterwards she would have thought, man, I should have bore that guy's bathtub. <laughs> I wish I would have brought that, you know, that 45 gallon barrel. I wish I would have brought that, you know. Because God, it would have kept pouring. There's no end to the oil flowing, amen? But you know, I want to talk about this oil. And I believe there's an oil in this house. Amen? And it's a costly oil. And I, I felt that there's, there's a healing anointing in this house. People are going to come. You know, there's vessels here. Each one of us are vessels. And the oil is being poured in. I don't know if I'm allowed to walk here. <laughs> this is all new to me, you know, all this, you know, international television ministry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have an international television ministry. I have a lady that watches from California. Well, a different place than but there's oil in the house. You know, I think of, in this house, there's been a contending for the healing anointing. There's been a contending for it. And the enemy does not want to see it. But there's a healing anointing in this house. I want to say it again, there's a healing anointing in this house. And people are going to be coming to be healed. Yeah. And they're going to be broken on the inside and they're going to be, they're, they're like, who wants me? I'm a nobody, I'm a nothing, but the oil will begin to flow. And it'll begin to flow into their hearts, into these vessels. And these vessels will go and bring more vessels and more vessels will be coming. And this place is going to be filled with vessels full of oil. Because they're going to be restored. You know, it's like the people that some, sometimes the people that no one wants. And God's going to begin to touch them. And they're going to be, they're going to be healed and restored. I have a friend. Uh, you know, I just love how God uses people. If I was God, I probably wouldn't have used him. Thank God I'm not God, you know. I mean, I, and he's a dear friend. I, should, I said that wrong. <laughs> I thought I'd get out of that one. But God uses unusual people. He, in fact, even uses me sometimes. And um, you know what? Him, they, 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 they started a church, and um, they had a, an anniversary last September, and he invited uh, Laura and I to they had a pizza thing afterwards. And, and we came to the place, and there were so many people there, we never got our share of pizza. But, but uh, they'd gone to the mall that, that week, and uh, there was a First Nation couple that they ministered to. And uh, they were in church that morning. And, uh, and there they were, and I'm, I'm here just eating, you know, my one piece of pizza. And, uh, and there's people praying over them, come out, come out, and ministering, and all kinds of things are happening, and people are being healed. This, this uh, First Nation couple, they were living together. They were broken, they had no place to live. And, and there they were being, minister to. And he, he looks to me, he says, uh, I think we need to do a water baptism. I said, well, yeah, you need to do the baptism. So they went down to the river and 16 people, all their friends and relatives, came down to the river to watch them be baptized. Amen? And, uh, and then they got married. And then I, I ministered at the church at the end of January, January 30th of this past year. And, and this couple comes up to me and says, do you remember us? We were in that service when you came. And she says, we have our own house. Not in our own, but they have an apartment, they have an address. We have pots and pans and a toaster and microwave and different things, you know. And the place is getting full of First Nation people. 
because the oil is being poured out. There's an oil that's being poured out. And I just want to say, Teresa, I believe this is for you too. That there's vessels that are going to come to this house. And you're going to pour in the oil. And they're, they're going to be restored and they're going to be healed. They're going to bring other vessels and they're going to be healed and they're going to be restored. Amen. God's going to use this place. Father, I thank you for the, for the graces and the anointings in this place. You know, I think of this song. He turns graves into gardens. He turns bones into armies. He turns seas into highways. Father, I thank you that you are doing something in this house. Father, where you're turning every grave into a garden. You're turning every bone into an army. You're taking the weak. You're taking the you're taking us because we present ourselves to you. And Father, I thank you there's an empowering coming. I thank you there's multiplication coming. Father, I thank you there's an abundance coming into people's hearts and into people's lives this morning. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for that. You know, I'm going to just leave us in, in, a, in our communion this morning, if that's okay. And so, how many have your cups with you, your elements with you this morning? I like how it says Jesus took the cup where he took the bread and he broke it. You know, something happens when Jesus would break bread. Things would begin to multiply. You know, there was two disciples on the road to, the, to Emmaus. And it says when they, they didn't recognize Jesus, but when he broke the bread, their eyes were opened. Father, I thank you this morning as we take the bread, as we take the cup. I, Father, I thank you this morning that uh, you take us. We offer ourselves this morning. Lord, even as, uh, as uh, you gave yourself for us, we give ourselves. And Lord, we ask that you would take us, that you would break us in Jesus' name. Break us, multiply us in Jesus' name. You know, Jesus said in John 6, he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. In other words, he's talking about manna, but he says, it's actually me. I came down. But you know, the, the Israelites, it says they despised the manna. They said, we don't want this worthless stuff. You know, Jesus gave his life and it's not worthless. It's special. It's a gift. Amen. So, Father, we thank you for the bread. We thank you for the body of Christ this morning. And Father, I thank you for this body. Father, I thank you for this house. Father, I thank you that you're taking each one of us this morning, each one in this house, and you're taking us. Could I lead us just in a simple prayer? I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say the word, if you don't want to say it, you don't have to say it, but I just want, I just feel like in some way, even with our words, we begin to acknowledge something this morning. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning. I give myself. Use me. Use me in whatever I capacity. In my weaknesses, I give them to you this morning. And I thank you this morning, Lord, that you empower, that you multiply, that you transform. I give you my business, my job, my family. I give, I give my the, the giftings and the callings in me. I present them to you this morning in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus. We thank you for this bread that we hold in our hands. We thank you, even as it represents the body of Christ. We receive his health. We receive his strength in us now, in Jesus' name. And I'm just going to break it. Father, I thank you. Use us in a fresh way, in Jesus' name. Let's drink together. Where are you today? Thank you, Jesus. And it says he took the cup. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus. You know, often when I think of the blood... You know, I, I just, some of these things just go through me. Father, I thank you for your blood. I said, I thank you, Lord, when the enemy sees the blood, he has to pass over us. Father, I thank you for your divine protection over each one of us. We thank you, Father, this morning that your blood speaks of better things 
than the blood of Abel. Father, I thank you that your blood speaks and it talks. Father, I thank you for the life that's in your blood. Father, I thank you that we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We love not our lives unto death. Father, we thank you for the blood. We make much of the blood in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for this cup. Father, this covenant that we have with you, that we walk together with you, that you never leave us nor forsake us. And so, Father, we thank you for the cup. We thank you for this communion. Let's drink together in Jesus' name. this, his life, all the, all the part of this is taken and it's going into our body. Father, we thank you for your divine life. And Father, I just thank you for divine life over life connection. Father, I thank you for the connections. I thank you for the connections with you that are the source of life. I thank you for the connections with each other. And Father, I thank you for multiplying this house in the name of Jesus. Amen. 